Now we're going to talk about um, the difference between standard double quotes and single quotes. And I see students use those intermittently and they almost, almost always use them incorrectly. If you are pulling text, so say I have this quote from a story uh, that I'm taking and I'm going to take these, these, this sentence as it is and drop it into my own paper, I always have to start with double quotation marks. I'll call them standard doubles. You have to put double quotes. The only time you use single quotes is when there is a mix of dialogue and action. Action here. This is action. And then we have dialogue. That makes it sound complicated. There's an easier way to handle this. Basically, if you're taking a source material quote, you're taking words from another source, and it has got quotation marks already, what you do, quite simply, is when you type your quote in, or copy and paste it in, you start open double quotes, Stanley stood in the garden screaming. When you get to their quotation marks, you change their, their quotation marks to singles, change this quotation mark because it was already in the quote to a single and then you end it with your doubles no space no extra thing like that you'll end up with double quote Stanley stood in the garden screaming comma single quote Stella Stella single quote double quote so when you are you, you only use single quotes in America in the United States in that case Anytime there are quotation marks in the source you're pulling from already, that's the only time you use them. Let's talk about um, attributive verbs. Attributive verbs. Well, first of all, we know that a verb is an action or a state of existence called a being verb. Am, is, was are being verbs. I am sick. That's a verb of existence. Am is a verb of existence. Saying, I am this thing, existing in this state. Attributive verbs, um, I also use a different term, which I think sometimes helps students. Attributive verbs, attribution is giving credit to. So the verb gives credit to a speaker. But I often use another word that I, another phrase, that I call communication verbs or verbs of communication. So, says, sang, yelled, typed, or I will text you. Um, that has become a verb in our modern language. These are all verbs of communication. They indicate that someone is communicating and that attributive verb is saying who's communicating. Thinks, we're going to throw in there with communication verbs. Who is thinking? Proof rock. So that's the attribution. But it's still in the form of dialogue. Proof rock thinks, comma. I am no prophet, and here is no great matter. Now, the attributive verb is thanks. Anytime you have an attributive verb, a communication verb, says, sang, thanked, yelled, bellowed, croaked, I croaked, my throat is sore. Um, those are all followed by a comma before the quote. Now, we have practiced recognizing dependent and independent clauses a great deal. Um, but what we've practiced so far this year is the dependent clause at the end of the sentence. Usually after a, a um, coordinated conjunction. But independent clauses can be at the beginning of, I mean dependent clauses can be at the beginning of sentences as well.
Now, we have practiced um, recognizing dependent and independent clauses um, throughout the year in our sentence construction practices. Sentences can also have the dependent clause at the beginning as an introductory clause. So, look here. According to Wally Lamb, if you take just that clause, it's dependent. It cannot stand by itself as a sentence. It's that, it's that baby clause. And it's got to have an adult independent clause in order to survive. Anytime you have a dependent clause that is three words or more, you really should have a comma. And this is true before a quote as well. This is a way of integrating a quote. Ellipses. Students love to use ellipses. And I don't have a problem with ellipses, except that somewhere, it seems, a teacher taught you that every time you quote, at least among the students that I have taught in recent years, every time you put a quote into a, a, uh, an essay, that you should have ellipses before and ellipses at the end of each quote because there's text before in the source and text after in the source. And that's really not necessary and in fact most of the time you want to avoid doing that. So I just say if you're integrating your quotes correctly you're not going to need ellipses at the beginning and end of your quote. Is it wrong? No it's not wrong. But stylistically your reader is going to notice the ellipses and they're going to notice your punctuation rather than focusing on what you're trying to say. And you don't want your punctuation to become so obvious that people are focused on how you punctuated versus what, you're, what point you're trying to get across. So, do not use ellipses at the beginning and ending of quotes for all intents and purposes. The only place you put take an ellipses or use an ellipses is in the middle when you are cutting out unnecessary words for what you're trying to prove or the point you're trying to make with the quote. So Hamlet tells Ophelia, you jig and amble and make your wantonness your ignorance. This is from Hamlet. Um, there's a lot more words in here that have been cut out of the middle, but my essay is perhaps talking about how he insults her personally. And so we have cut how he calls her names, and we have cut out the unnecessary stuff to focus the quote in on the point of him name calling her. So don't use ellipses unnecessarily. Don't use them at the beginning of quotes. If you're doing quotation mark ellipses, don't do that. If you're doing ellipses close quotes, don't do that. Avoid that. Keep it in the middle of your quote if you're cutting words out that are unnecessary. Another thing about ellipses is it is not dot, dot, dot. It is actually you have your last letter and you go space, dot, space, dot, space, dot, space, and then you have your next letter. It's not just dot, dot, dot. There's actually spaces between each dot. Um, so, the next thing I want to talk to you about, and introductory clauses before quotes, and, and even attributive verbs, and these sorts of things, we've been kind of been working with this. But I want you to really practice not doing that my sentence, my sentence, a full quote sentence, and then my sentence, my sentence, my sentence. Um, I really want you to begin practicing how you go from your words directly into the words of the source material you're quoting from and then back out as smoothly as possible. Basically what I'm saying is if you didn't have the quotation marks, I want it to be very difficult for your reader to know what was quoted material and what is your material. I'm not saying that it's okay to steal that. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that the quotation marks, minus the quotation marks, it should flow smoothly the words that you're borrowing along with the words you're making. Knight views the symbolism in Jones's play as a creation and destruction pattern. Notice how it's all one sentence. 
Some students believe they need a comma before, quote, every time they put a quote in one sentence with their own words. And that's not the case. That's the case with dependent introductory clauses, attributive verbs, and where there would normally be a comma in a sentence. Here, there would be no comma here. Doesn't belong here. So you don't put it now. This makes a much more smooth, more sophisticated, more mature piece of writing. There is a time when you use a colon in um, integrating quotes. They should not be used often. The rule of thumb is what's before the colon and what's after the colon each have to be independent clauses. They have to be complete sentences on their own. And there has to be a very close connection, like the quote is illustrating what was said before the colon. So, Edith Hamilton describes Hera, the goddess Hera, perfectly. Edith Hamilton was a um, scholar of mythology, and her book is still considered very authoritative. So we have a complete clause here. Edith Hamilton describes Hera perfectly. She was the protector of marriage, and married women were her particular care. So this quote is backing up what was said before the colon. It's the proof. It's the restatement in the form of a quote. And they're both independent clauses. So they're closely connected in idea, and they're independent clauses. Things to avoid. Um, stay away from things like, on page 24, the narrator says. That's artificial, and if they have a different pagination, a different book version, um, it may not be page 24. In chapter 3, this quote says, oh, this is the death nail here. This quote says, never announce the material as quoted. This quote says, this quote shows. The character says, avoid those things. Occasionally, you might use this one, but I would avoid these, definitely, and never refer to the quote. This quote says, or the previous quote demonstrated, never announce the quote or refer to the quote directly. And they, they shouldn't be fully conscious. They know there's a quote there, but it should flow, your words and the quote should flow in and out of each other without those reminders that they're reading. They should be focused on your meaning. All right, there we are. Those are the things that I want to tell you about and we're gonna practice in the coming days. We're also gonna have a test over this very soon. So be paying attention for that.